Good morning. Before we get to our song this morning, uh, I want to let you know that I miss you. I miss you all. I know that everyone has their own difficulties at this period of time, the way things are in society right now. Um, but uh, you know, we all have different different problems. For me, it's uh, being away from you and uh, uh, doing this type of preaching. This is more difficult than uh, the normal preaching. Uh, when I get to see your faces, I, uh, it, uh, it's a different a different feeling. I know a lot of people might have a different uh, difficult time uh, standing in front of people, but uh, it's a lot easier for me to have you with me as I preach. But uh, anyway, I like seeing your faces. I don't like looking at a camera. And, uh, and we have a, a birthday this week uh, coming up on Saturday. It is Bernie Hudson's birthday, Saturday, May 2nd. Happy birthday, Bernie. Uh, we will sing to you and, and everyone else who missed singing uh, their, on their birthday for this time that we, we have. So, um, but happy birthday, Bernie. Uh, we miss you. Our memory verse for the month of April has been uh, Romans 8, 31. So let's say that together. Romans 8, 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. Uh, now turn in your Bibles uh, to the book of Esther for our Bible reading, Esther chapter 5. Esther chapter 5. And to follow along as I read Esther chapter 5. Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel, and stood in the inner court of the king's house, over against the king's house, and the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house. And it was so when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then said the king unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther? And what is thy request? It shall be even given thee to the half of the kingdom. And Esther answered, If it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, Cause Haman to make haste, that he may do as Esther hath said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had prepared. And the king said unto Esther at the banquet of wine, What is thy petition? and it shall be granted thee, and what is thy request? Even to the half of the kingdom it shall be performed. Then answered Esther, and said, My petition and my request is, If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my petition, and to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I shall prepare for them, and I will do tomorrow as the king hath said. Then went Haman forth that day joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself. And when he came home, he sent and called for his friends and Zeresh his wife. And Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children and all the things wherein the king had promoted him, and how he had advanced him above the princes and servants of the king. Haman said, Moreover, Yea, Esther the queen did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared but myself, and tomorrow am I invited unto her also with the king. Yet all this availeth me nothing, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then said Zeresh his wife and all his friends unto him, Let a gallows be made of fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for being here with us today, watching over us even though we are separated from one another. I pray that you would work in the service today, work through the message that the Holy Spirit would speak to each one of our hearts. Help us to look forward to what you have for us, not just in this message, but uh, in the future. 
Lord, you want the best for us. I pray that you would guide us in listening to the word of God so that uh, the Holy Spirit can touch our hearts and give us strength as we depend on you, as we have faith that you're going to work out all things for good for us who love you and those of us who are called according to your purpose. Guide us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to uh, sing a song, or actually, you're going to see the words on the screen, so follow along as we uh, sing Showers of Blessing. Turn in our Bibles to two passages of Scripture, uh, Ezekiel chapter 34. I want you to turn to Ezekiel chapter 34 first of all, and then um, we'll go to Psalm 23. So first of all, go to Ezekiel 34, hang on to that, and then go over to Psalm 23. Psalm 23. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of time to get there. Psalm 23 and Ezekiel 34. So we're going to start at Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now go over to Ezekiel chapter 34. Hang on to Psalm 23. We're going to come back there too. Ezekiel 34. And let me read two sections in here. Verses number uh, 1 through 6 and then we'll jump down to verse number 11. Beginning at verse number 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Ye eat the fat, and ye clothe you with the wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away. 
neither have ye sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. And they were scattered, because there is no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field, when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains, and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. We see here the, the difference between human shepherds who uh, feed themselves rather than feed the flock, take care of themselves rather than take care of the, uh, the people of God. And uh, it's a sharp contrast to what we saw in Psalm 23 of God uh, being our shepherd. Now jump down to verse number 11, and we'll go read verses 11 through 16. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold I, even I will both search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good fold and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. I will seek that which was lost, and bring again that which was driven away, and will bind up that which was broken. I will strengthen that which was sick, but I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment. And again, God shows himself as being a proper shepherd, a good shepherd, because he wants good for the sheep. And so we're going to look today at God blessing his people. When you compare Psalm 23 to um, Ezekiel, where the shepherds did not take care of the flock, it's a bad scene. It's a bad picture uh, for the people. But when God shows himself, remember Psalm 23 was written by David long before uh, Ezekiel wrote what he did and what God said uh, he would do. David knew it. David knew God was a, a great shepherd. He says, let's go back to Psalm 23, and we'll read part of the, la the verse number 5. He says, uh, in the, the last little phrase of verse number 5, he says, my cup runneth over. My cup runneth over. Uh, look over, you can close that now. We'll just remember that, uh, where David says, my cup runneth over. And he's, he's recognizing God taking care of him, God bringing blessings. In Ezekiel chapter 34, we see another, a couple of verses. We'll read verses 25 and 26, but I just want you to focus and look at verse number 26 right now. Verse number 26, God says, and he's talking about his children, of course, in the Old Testament specifically, it's the children of Israel, uh, God's chosen people, but we can apply it to ourselves today because we are God's people. Verse number 26, and I will make them and the places round about my hill a blessing. And I will cause the shower to come down in his season. There shall be showers of blessing. And if you paid attention, we had just uh, seen, or we hopefully we sang the song, there shall be showers of blessing. Looking at what God wants to do for us, his people. God wants to shower uh, blessings. When David said, my cup runneth over, he's telling us that God doesn't stop at just sprinkles of blessing. The song said, mercy drops around us are falling. Uh, God wants to go farther than that. God wants to bless us immensely. And that's why he says there shall be showers of blessing. And when you pour a, a glass of water, uh, or a glass of milk for that matter, and you pour it and you, you want a full glass of milk, do you pour it right up to the very top, the very brim of the of the glass or do you leave it down a quarter of an inch or an eighth of an inch and you still call it full you probably do it that way because you spill it when you try to take it over to the table or anything or even lift it up to drink it if it was all the way to the top but when God gives us his blessing 
David said, my cup runneth over. And uh, if you ever pour a glass of water or milk and you let it run over, you know that you've just wasted a bunch of stuff. But God, when he says, my cup runs over, and he wants to uh, overfill the cup, he's going to have a saucer underneath it. He's going to let you have all the blessing. He's not going to waste anything. And so we need to recognize God wants to do much for us. God wants to bring showers of blessing. He doesn't want us to stop. We look at an illustration in the Old Testament when um, the widow had a jar of oil or a pitcher of oil. And I believe it was Elijah that said, um, I always get it mixed up, Elijah or Elisha, but one of them said, uh, pour out the oil and God is going to continue to bless you. And as long as his, her uh, sons brought uh, more empty jars or empty vessels, there was oil left over in that vessel that she had. But it wasn't until they had no more place to put it that the oil stopped. And uh, she could use the oil that, was, that she poured out and sell, sold it to uh, pay off her bills and things, take care of herself and her sons. But God kept the blessing coming. He did not stop it. So God uh, wants us uh, to have much blessing. I want you to go to uh, the book of Leviticus. We want to look at how God uh, il illustrates his blessings, his spiritual blessings, uh, physical blessings upon us, and how we need to recognize what he wants to do, and we need to live in a manner that he uh, describes for us how to live. Leviticus chapter 25, and we've, we've uh, seen this recently, I believe, about... Uh, what God says about the, the land, letting the land rest for, uh, for a year, uh, and then he will provide. He provides extra on the sixth year uh, before the seventh year so that they could have enough to live on for several years until they plant and harvest again. Leviticus chapter 25, look at verse number 3. He says, Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest, thou shalt not reap, neither gather the grapes of thy vine undressed. For it is a year of rest unto the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you, for thee and for thy servant, and for thy maid, and for thy hired servant, and for thy stranger that sojourneth with thee, and for thy cattle, and for the beasts that are in thy land, shall all the increase thereof be meat. So he says, uh, you work the land and harvest uh, for six years, and then on the seventh year, you let the land rest as it as the, the anything that grows of itself they could eat but they could not go and harvest it and sell it uh, they were supposed to let the land rest uh, it became what is called fallow uh, go over to Jeremiah chapter 4 Jeremiah chapter 4 Jeremiah 4, and we're going to start, uh, read a couple of verses, starting at verse number 3. Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse number 3. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn, that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. He says to break up your fallow ground, and that's talking about the, the fallow ground is uncultivated or, or it's just let, left to rest, left to uh, grow things on its own, and that's what we saw uh, in uh, Leviticus. God wanted them to do, let the land rest. Uh, I'll bring forth some things, and it'll grow, it'll grow weeds too. But don't go out and pull the weeds, just leave it alone. But here, he says, break up your fallow ground. And he's not talking about uh, the, the land. 
He's talking about their hearts. Uh, get the heart, get the ground of your heart ready to plant uh, so that the harvest of your heart will be a good one. He says, don't plant just anywhere. Notice what he said. He says, and sow not among the thorns. Don't be planting seed out in, in where the, the thorns are grow or where the weeds are going to grow. Break it up and prepare the ground. Get it ready for a good harvest. Get it ready for good seed uh, that is to be sown. This reminds me, and it probably reminds you, of what Jesus said in the New Testament as he gave the uh, parable of the sower. Go over to Matthew, Matthew chapter 13. He tells the parable of the sower where the, the man went out to sow the seed or plant the seed or he scattered it around. Uh, back then they didn't necessarily go in and uh, dig on, like you see on the packages of seed, you know, put a hole in the ground about an inch deep and then put two or three seeds in and then cover it over. They didn't go around on their fields like that. That would have taken them years just to plant one field. So they take the seed and they would scatter it. And here uh, Jesus gives this picture of scattering the seed and some of it lands on good ground and some of the seed lands on uh, unprepared or, or bad ground. So notice what he says when he gives the interpretation of this parable and uh, one particular place where the seed is sown. And, and I'm not going to go through the whole parable, but this one particular place uh, actually reminds me of, of what Jeremiah says. Uh, look at chapter 13 and verse number 22. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. Now, uh, I didn't say this, and Jesus said it. The seed is the word of God. Okay, so the seed is what is being sown in the hearts of men. He says, he hears the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he become unfruitful. And uh, he's, he's saying this is the seed that was uh, planted in a, in a bad spot. Now, if you want to uh, notice what he says, uh, oh, let's see. In verse number 7, when he gave the example of the, of the seed itself, he says, And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. And he likens the, uh, the cares of this world to the thorns, or the thorns to the cares of the world. And so back in Jeremiah, he's saying, Don't sow among the thorns. He's basically telling us to get rid of the things uh, in our life that are going to choke out God's word when it is supposed to make a difference in our lives and do something uh, special in us. Uh, if you know where we are on our land, we have, a, we have a, um, about an acre of a land behind us. And right now, this time of the year, uh, all the weeds have grown up. And there's, uh, well, you don't see so many um, tumbleweeds out there right now, but it has been left fallow. And you, you wouldn't go out there and plant your seed in the middle of the field uh, behind it, behind our church here, uh, without first cutting down and plowing under the weeds that are there. The weeds naturally grow on their own, and it doesn't make sense to plant good seed in the ground that has weeds already growing. The land is fallow and needs to be broken up and plowed before you would plant crops. Once the field has been broken up and turned under, and you've planted the seed, you would watch the land. You would watch uh, the good seed sprout and grow. While it is growing, you'd pull out the weeds. You'd cultivate and, and make sure the, the nutrients in the ground um, gave the, the nutrition to the good seeds, the plants that you want to harvest from, instead of going to the weeds. So make sure the weeds don't take the nutrients out of the ground. You pull the weeds. Uh, you might hoe them. But it's that way in the Christian life. As the Word of God begins to grow in our lives and we begin to grow spiritually, there are times when the things of this world pull us away. And we need to uh, get rid of those things that are hindering uh, uh, us from being the kind of people, the, the Christians that God wants us to be. Uh, go over to the book of Hosea. Hosea 
chapter 10. Hosea chapter 10. You might not get there very quick, but let me, let me just go ahead and read it. In uh, Hosea chapter 10 and verse number 12, he says, Sow to yourselves. Now, sow means not, not sowing as in, in uh, a needle and thread. Sow, plant seeds. He says, sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap or harvest in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness on you. And here, the, again, the rain is the picture of, of his blessing uh, upon us. Go over to Deuteronomy chapter 10. He says, break up your fallow ground. Again, he's not talking about the land. It's a great picture, especially for the people of um, Israel who used the land and harvested uh, grain and harvested uh, olive, so for olive oil and grapes for uh, grape juice and wine. And he, he uses that as a picture, but it's really about our hearts. Look what he says in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse number 16. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. He's, 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 he's talking about the, uh, the unnecessary things in our lives, in our hearts, that need to be removed and cut away. And, and there's no, no foreskin of the heart. He's talking about uh, spiritual things uh, or unspiritual things that, that take away our righteousness and pull those things away so that God's word would make a great difference in our lives. Go over to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. And verse number 11. Colossians 2:11. And he's talking about uh, Christ, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. He's talking about Christ making a difference, Christ coming along and, and taking away what is unnecessary something we don't need in our lives that pull us away from, from Christ. And Christ is going to do the work. But it's about our hearts. It's not about the land. Okay? Circumcise the foreskin of your heart. Get rid of those things that are, are uh, keeping you from a good harvest of fruit. The New Testament tells us that we should bring forth fruit, uh, the fruits of the Spirit, a, a, a Christian life that is seen by others to honor God and uh, that's what we should be doing it's the way we should live we need to prepare ourselves we need to prepare our, our hearts and, and break up the uh, unnecessary things and get rid of the weeds and get rid of the uh, thorns that are there and, and break up that ground so that when the word of God comes in it grows and multiplies and we don't have the other things taking away the nutrients of God's word. Let's go back to Ezekiel uh, 34. Ezekiel 34. And remember what he said. He said, I will bring showers. Ezekiel 34 and verse number. Well, let's start at verse 25. He says, I, and I will make with them a covenant of peace and will cause the evil beasts to cease out of the land. You know, he's, he's showing us a picture of whatever it is, of Satan, satanic things, and say, Satan wants to come in and, and bother us. And he says, I'm going to get take care of those evil beasts. Yes, we need to break up the fallow ground. We need to pull up the weeds and get rid of them. God is going to do his part. We need to be ready to hear what he has to say. So he, he says, I'm going to get rid of the evil beasts uh, to cease out of the land, and they shall dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. And I will make them and the places round about my hill a blessing, and I will cause the shower to come down in his season. There shall be showers of blessing. 
we are God's people, God's children, and uh, we are, the Bible tells us that we are the children of Abraham, which are blessed with um, Abraham. Go over to Galatians, the book of Galatians, chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, that's us, we, without Christ, he justifies us through our faith. We put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are justified or declared righteous, uh, justified the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, they which be of faith, those who have put their faith in Christ, are blessed with faithful Abraham. And so we are blessed. And it's not just about salvation. It's about God's blessing to come on our lives all the time. But it's going to be up to us. God doesn't, doesn't limit his blessings unless we don't do our part. Just like we, you, you're, you're not going to expect a, a great harvest in that field behind the church if you don't break up the fallow ground and get it ready. Don't expect a blessing in your life if you're disobedient to God. Don't expect Him to bring wonderful things to you. So many people in this world say, oh, I pray, I, I talk to God but they do not obey him. They have never put their faith in Jesus Christ. They're not going to be blessed. They will not be blessed. Oh, they might get the riches of this world, but it's not the riches of Christ. It's not the eternal riches that God wants to give them. Uh, go over to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. And look at verse number 7. Hebrews 6, verse number 7. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed receiveth blessing from God. Now there's a picture again. Uh, he's, he's showing the earth. The earth receives the rain, receives the showers uh, for, their, for their physical crops. But that's the picture of what should be in our hearts. Verse number 8. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints, and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself saying, Surely, blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. So he promised Abraham a blessing, a great blessing. And when we look at us being children of Abraham, we receive the same blessing. We receive blessings from God because he wants us to do, to do that. Look what he says here. Go back to right here in the same chapter. Look at verse number 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Now that word perfection is, is the idea of being uh, mature, growing into maturity. He's talking about spiritual children. And he says, Don't, well, let's read what he says. Go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance, from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. And now, he, he's, he's saying, stop just staying babies. Stop just uh, listening to the, the gospel message all the time. Stop 
staying in the foundation. Now the foundation is great. The foundation of Jesus Christ has been established. Now we grow up into an edifice. We are to be edified and growing stronger spiritually. This is what, what an edifice is. It's a building. Nobody builds a foundation and says, okay, now I'm done. And they live on the, unless they want a skating rink or something. But a foundation is to be built upon. Not, that's not the end result. You might see some foundations having been built. You know, sometimes they've, they've done it around here when they build a house. They build a foundation, but the economy goes down, so the foundation just sits there. And nothing is built upon it. Who's going to use it? Nobody. It's good for nothing. So a foundation is only as good as we build on it. Of course, Jesus Christ is the sh sure foundation, and when you have salvation in Christ, uh, you're okay, but... God wants you to be built on that foundation. God wants you to grow into maturity, spiritual maturity. Go on into perfection, he says. Uh, look down at, uh, well, we read verse 7. So he's, he's saying, he's showing verse, uh, verses 1 through 3 to be growing. And that growing is the idea, the picture he gives us of the earth drinking in the, the, uh, the rain that God uh, brings in. So when we break up our fallow ground, when we recognize the things in our hearts that are wrong, we should do like that, that man did when uh, he, he had a son who was, the, the Bible says, lunatic. He, um, he fell down, or he was demon-possessed, and he came to Jesus and he said this, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. See, if we don't come to Christ and say, or God say, God, I know this is true. I know what you uh, want from me. Help me to get rid of those things, that unbelief that I'm hanging on to. Get rid of that so I can be built up. So I can take in your blessings and grow by it. We, we, when we break up our fallow ground of our hearts and we get rid of those things, God wants us to expect blessings. There shall be, he says, there shall be showers of blessing. We need to need him to, or we need to expect him to bless us. We need him, we need to expect him to bless our families. Or we should expect him to bless our friends. We should expect him to bless our efforts and our church. We should expect him to bless our life. Go over to the book of Psalm. Psalm, Psalm 62. Psalm 62. We're going to start at verse number 5. Psalm 62, verse number 5. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. <laughs> See, there's that expectation, and, and that's what He wants to do. He wants to bring us showers of of blessing. It says, He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. So God is the one we should be trusting in. God is the one who's going to make a difference in our life. But it's up to us to get ready for his word to come in. So that word grows stronger and stronger and builds us up into the people God wants us to be. Blessings come through faith. Blessings come because we are obedient. Blessings also come uh, as we give. And I want to look at those for a little bit. Uh, blessings come through faith. Go over to Leviticus chapter 25. Leviticus chapter 25. Leviticus 25 and uh, verse number 1. 
And the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. I know I read this, but let's finish here. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. Now, he, we, we saw that. He told them that. But, of course, in, in their hearts, there's a, there's a, a wonder. So wait, wait a minute. If I'm not going to plant anything, what, what am I going to live on? And they actually ask him uh, that question. But look what he says. Look, go down to verse number 20. And if ye shall say, if you ask this question, what shall we eat the seventh year? Behold, uh, we shall not sow, nor gather in our increase. And God says this, Then I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years. And ye shall sow the eighth year, and eat yet of old fruit until the ninth year, until her fruits come in. You shall eat of the old store. And so he makes it very clear. I'm going to give you enough for three years on the sixth year. Uh, because on the sixth year or on the seventh year, you're not going to plant. And so during the seventh year, you're not going to have anything to eat. And so they give, he gives them food for the sixth year the seventh or the seventh year. And then uh, they have to plant the eighth year, but they have to wait for that plant, that uh, harvest to come in. And so then they'll eat in the ninth year. So he gives them food for three years worth so they have time uh, enough to eat. But would they do it? Well, blessings come by faith. And so they, by faith, did if they did that, if they let the land rest, God would bless them. I am sure that the very first sixth year, and that's kind of funny, the first sixth year, uh, they had three years worth of food. I don't know about any time after that because we know that they did not let the land rest. But in the sixth year, God gave the, the first sixth year, God gave them enough for three years. And they may have let the, left the land fallow. They may have left it rest the seventh year. The Bible doesn't tell us. But I know God. And I know that he gave them three years worth of food on that sixth year. All I can think of is why they didn't is that, is that they, they were greedy. Well, I got a whole lot this year. Boy, we're going to plant again and have a, a bunch like this next year too. Of course, God judged them because they never let the land rest like they should have. Uh, but they, they would have been blessed every seventh year, every sixth year because they did what God said. They believed God, and they lived by faith. Go over to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, and I'm going to stop right after this. Matthew chapter 6, and look what Jesus says. And he's, he's talking, he's telling them about worrying. Don't worry. Don't, don't be concerned about the future because God's going to take care of you. And that's a matter of faith. That's living by faith. Verse number, um, chapter 6, look at verse number 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. That means don't worry about it. What ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat or food, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, Neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? He says, you're much better than an animal. You're much better than a bird. God takes care of the birds. Don't worry about things. Let God take care of you, because God wants to shower you with blessings. Look down here at verse number 30. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O oh, ye of little faith. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? 
or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But, and here it is, to break up your fallow ground. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. God wants to bless. God will take care of you. And God wants to bless and bless and bless. We need to live by faith. We need to be obedient. And we need to recognize that everything we have comes from him. And so we need to expect his blessing. I'm going to stop right here, but I want to go on uh, next time in uh, talking about the blessings that, that actually follow obedience and, and how God wants to, to, to pour out his blessings on us. We just need to expect and we need to recognize our expectation comes from him. He is the one that wants to bless us and bring all the spiritual blessings that he wants to pour out on us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to recognize that we should depend on you. We should expect blessings from you. And Lord, we can't expect those blessings if we are disobedient. We can't expect blessings from you if we are uh, living away from you. Why would we expect that? We don't expect good from uh, the way we treat people evil. It's just a not, not uh, doesn't make any sense. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to recognize that our um, the way we live is uh, what you're looking at to bring us blessings. Help us to see the thorns. Help us to see the weeds in our lives uh, that we should cut out and break up our fallow ground so that the blessing of God would come on our lives. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.